Hi, I'm Lynn Davis, and welcome to Discussions on Democracy. I'm the program manager for a nonpartisan nonprofit organization called Healthy Democracy that designs and coordinates innovative deliberative democracy programs. We're partnering with the City of Eugene to facilitate a first of its kind review panel. The issue up for deliberation is the implementation of HB 2001, a bill passed by the Oregon Legislature in 2019 that mandates all cities in Oregon expand the types of housing they allow in single family zones. Our goal in partnering with the city is, as always, unbiased, high quality public engagement. The panel has already been selected through a randomized lottery based process that helps ensure broad, accurate representation. The review panel has also already had its first round of meetings, and it's a wonderful, diverse group of folks eager to engage on this issue. The purpose of this show, Discussions on Democracy, is to explain the process we're going through. This is the second in the series, and in this episode we'll be talking about something we call the Democratic Lottery. To help understand exactly what that means and how it gets implemented, we have two guests, Paul Goals and Bailey Flanagan. They're both PhD students in computer science at Carnegie Mellon University who design software for precisely this kind of randomized selection process, the kind that we went through to create this Eugene Review Panel. So if you like technology and are curious about how the selection of the panel worked, then this is the show for you. Bailey and Paul, welcome to Discussions on Democracy. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. So we're talking today about the selection process for these kind of events. They're called a number of different things. The old word was sortition, a sort of academic word. Um, now folks are calling them civic lotteries or democratic lotteries or democracy lotteries. Uh, Bailey, can you just describe what this thing is? Yeah, sure. So the basic idea is that you want to select a group of people to make decisions on behalf of the broader population. And there's kind of two components in what you want out of this group. First, you want them to be selected randomly, which gives you some advantages like getting people who normally wouldn't necessarily be participating directly in making these decisions. But you also want this group to be representative of the population. You can kind of think of it as you want a mini version of the population in the room making a decision. Right, 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 right. And before we talk more about sort of the details of what that looks like, uh, can you just tell me why, why you first got involved in, in working on this? Sure. Um, I think Paul's origin story might be a little more interesting. I joined Carnegie Mellon as a graduate student when this work was already underway. Um, but the reason that I am really excited about it is because I think this type of random selection of a decision-making committee offers this really great balance of getting the voices of many members of the population while also allowing a more informed group of people to make the decisions because you have some time due to the small size of this group to get like more concentrated resources um, to inform people about more details of the issues before they make the decision. Yeah, and Paul, how did you uh, get started and interested in this? Um, I actually got interested in dissertation before I joined grad school and before I started doing research specifically on politics. Uh, back when I was just a, a run-of-the-mill computer scientist, uh, I was reading about sortition. I was reading David Van Raybrook's book, Against Elections, where he just makes this beautiful case about why you might want to make decisions by sortition. And I just really like this idea that random citizens off the streets from, from all walks of life are able to make complicated and difficult decisions on their own. And um, I've been interested in that ever since. Yeah, and, and this isn't a new idea. Um, Paul, can you just a very quickly sort of the background of what, what the sort of history of this idea is as a democratic process? Yeah, um, of course. The idea of sortition came up in ancient Athens in the 4th and 5th century BC. And uh, back then, democracy actually meant exactly this. Democracy meant sortition, not uh, election. And unfortunately, this idea was kind of lost uh, during the time of the French and the American Revolution and only let the, the only remnant that stayed around were juries, where you still have random selection and the idea that random peers can make a good decision on whether you're guilty or not. But now in the last 35 years, this idea is really coming back to life and coming back in many experiments. And this is really exciting. Right. Yeah. And um, Bailey, you mentioned a moment ago, sort of the reasons why, why for the random side of it and the representative side of it together. 
And in jury service, which we're familiar with here in the US, we sort of have the random side, but we don't necessarily have the representative side. Or it's not built into the system. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that sort of representative angle. We know what random looks like, more or less. Um, but but what, is, what is sort of the, the representative side of that, of that look like? Can you talk a little bit more about sort of what the, what the different things are that you might, what the different categories are that you might uh, um, be, try to represent? Sure. So when we say representative, another way of saying that is proportional. Like if a certain group makes up half the population, you would hope that they would make up about half the panel. And this can't be true for every single possible group that you can define, but practitioners like to pick um, a set of like maybe four or five, six different what we call features um, that they like to see represented on their panels proportionally to the underlying population. Some examples of those are gender, race, age, often um, your underlying opinion on the issue that's being discussed on the panel, um, and generally geographic region I've seen included pretty frequently. Uh, for this project in Eugene, we're using those those you mentioned, but not a not an ideological marker, but uh, but all the other four, and then um, educational attainment. I'm not sure if you mm -hmm. that one. Oh, I and, didn't, but that's a common one too. Right, and for this one, renter or homeowner status and disability mm -hmm. status, um, which we haven't used before. That one, that last one, is a, is a unique one. The rest of them we've used before, and and there's actually one other one that we haven't mentioned that we use in the Citizens Initiative Review or other. Uh, some other programs, which is like a voter frequency, like a political participation kind of metric. I think in, in our case, it's usually been a binary category, has the person voted in two out of the last four gubernatorial elections, something like that. Is that, I, I've always actually wondered, is that common? Is that, does anybody else use that kind of category, a participation kind of category? Paul, do you know? No, not that I have seen. Okay, interesting. Well, <laughs> it's kind of, uh, I mean, I suppose we're, we're sort of naturally getting that in a way from, from doing the random selection. Um, but this actually brings me to the sort of uh, next point, which is about the, the differential response rates uh, between, uh, I mean, the difference between the sort of rate in the general population and the response rates that we see. But there's some of these other categories that we've noticed. Um, that that have you know sort of really different rates, different response rates. Um, for example, uh, middle-aged folks. Interestingly, and this is very like uh, true for the U.S. only. In other projects and other places, um, I think they it's a little bit different. Um, but here, middle-aged folks tend to respond at the highest rates, and older folks and younger folks, younger folks especially, white folks tend to respond at, at higher rates. Uh, than people of color. Women tend to respond at about 60-40 in our, in our samples usually um, versus uh, men. Um, and folks with higher educational attainment is maybe the toughest one. I, I feel like I've heard that from other practitioners. I don't know if you've heard that as well. That, that, is, that is maybe the most difficult one to fill uh, to make sure that all the categories sort of have enough folks in them. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we, we can definitely confirm that. Um, there have been panels where we looked into this question in quite some detail, and higher education levels are definitely much more present in the pool of volunteers than, than in the general population. Another, uh, another question that, that often really makes or breaks a decision whether people will respond is when there are questions that relate to whether people find the panel overall meaningful or not. So for example, in panels on climate change, we found that people who don't believe that climate change is a real issue are much less likely to participate than people who do. So let's talk a little bit about where these targets come from. Uh, Bailey, what's the, where is sort of the, yeah, where, where do the, where the, each, each subcategory, let's say age and, you know, people 18 to 24, or 25 to 34, et cetera, each of those categories has a, has a target number that we're looking for on the panel. Where do those come from? Yeah, so as we mentioned in the very beginning of this conversation, you really want the panel to be representative, which means that you kind of want it to look like a mini version of the population um, where certain groups are proportionally represented. And so where we get these target numbers, um, and these target numbers are specifically the number of people on the panel, you want to have a certain feature. We get them from the census data. And so if the census data says 25% of the population is between the ages of 18 and 26, then we want 25% of the panel to fall into that age range approximately. Um, 
And so if you have 100 people on the panel, that would be 25 people. And that's where we would get that target from. Right. And I should mention, we just used different sort of age ranges here. For this project, we used um, 16 Sorry. and up. Uh, the city wanted to use, you, you know, represent folks in, in that range. So the targets actually are 16 to 24, 35 to, or sorry, 25 to 34, and then up by, by sort of decades after that, up to 75 and up. Um, sure. Paul, anything to add about sort of where the targets come from or how they're calculated? Often, some of these categories can't actually be found on the census. For example, if you want to include information about uh, partisan leaning, you don't get that from the census, but you might get that from party registrations, you might get that from opinion polls. And so uh, these percentages come from a whole lot of places. The other point is that, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, no. Um, another point is that typically these targets aren't actually just single numbers, but you specify both how many people you would ideally want and the, the flexibility that you have in this category. So you might want to say, really, you, you might not want to say that 25 out of the 50 people have to be women, but you might want to say between 24 and 26 is all okay. And this gives you some flexibility to really satisfy all these different constraints at the same time. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, there, there are almost always ranges because if we think about it, whether we're doing it by hand or with software, we have to satisfy a whole bunch of different categories and, 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 and subcategories under them all at the same time, which is quite a, a big ask. And I wanted to mention that for this particular project, the city decided to use the school age population uh, as the sort of basis for, uh, for race and ethnicity and for disability status. Um, disability status, interestingly, is, is one that's a little bit uh, tricky to get from the census. There's a number of different questions. Race and ethnicity is, is not as complicated, but they wanted to represent sort of the future of the city, um, essentially, by, by using the school age population as the targets for those. But everything else in this project is directly from the 2019 uh, one-year estimates uh, from the American Community Survey from the census. Let's talk a little bit now sort of the old method of, of doing this selection process and I'll tell you how we did it. Uh, for the first decade or so of the CIR we, we, we did it all by hand um, up until I think yeah up through 2018 actually uh, and we would, we would convene a little committee of, of past panelists uh, usually um, or actually in the CIR, we'd have both of the, the advocate campaigns on the pro and con side sitting there, and they would sort of be election observers in a way, and we'd also have this panel. And we'd anonymize all the data that came in and give, I sort of regret that we don't do this anymore because it was kind of fun. We'd have, you know, in the, uh, for age, uh, we used, because it was in Oregon, we used sort of Oregon state symbols. <laughs> so, I don't know, age was like different types of salmon or something, as we have coho and chinook or whatever. And then, you know, for uh, gender, we'd have um, the state colors, maybe blue and gold or whatever they are. Um, and then, so we'd sort, of, we'd sort of have all these categories, and then the panel uh, would sit down and would go through the categories essentially in order of, um, in order of need or how, how um, sort of uh, sparsely populated any given kind of subcategory is. So for example, if uh, folks who had some schooling but no diploma, if that was like the one, oh gosh, we only have three people that responded and we need two people on the panel, well then that one is sort of the highest, the highest need. So let's select that, that first and select that and then kind of go down the, down the list in terms of need. Um, hopefully by the end, kind of getting to a point where we almost have a panel that meets all the targets. Uh, but, but usually not quite, so then you have to sort of back up a little bit and reshuffle, back up and reshuffle. Uh, and as I understand it, I think that's how the first sort of version of this software, which we used in this program in Eugene, uh, works. Is that right, Bailey? The way that it works is basically the software looks at the set of quotas that it needs to satisfy, these being like the targets, and it looks at which is the most dire, essentially. It's saying like, the ratio of how many people you still need in this group to how many people you have left available in your pool of volunteers. And it picks a person from the group that will move towards satisfying the quota that is the most dire. And it does this iteratively, adding people to the panel and adding two people to the panel. And it hopefully will find a panel that satisfies all the quotas. Sometimes the quotas cannot be satisfied. 
And sometimes this approach won't find a panel, even when the quotas can be satisfied. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit more detail later if you're interested. Um, but this is basically how current algorithms work. Right. So as I understand it, and sort of when you see it on screen or if you watch the selection event, that it will try to select a panel. And then if it can't, it'll, it'll, just, it'll just sort of try again. It's a little bit brute force, right, Bailey? Um, I've seen different algorithms do this slightly differently, but yeah, they adopt this approach of kind of like, oh, we've entered a place where we don't think we can find a panel. Okay, now backtrack and try again, or maybe restart and just try finding a whole new panel again. Right. And Paul, um, so you both have been working on a couple now new iterations of, of how to do this better. Um, what sort of problems were you seeking to solve in that version of the software, and what does the new software uh, look like, and what does it do? Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to speak about that. Um, so the problem that we specifically see with the old algorithm that was in place is that the probabilities with which people are selected might be very uneven. So, for example, you might have a person who is selected very infrequently, and you might have other people who are selected all the time. And to some degree, this is just unavoidable. For example, imagine that uh, way fewer women, uh, a, a much smaller fraction of women responds than men, then the women who make it into the pool, of course, have to be selected much more frequently if we want to fill half of the panel with women. So some of that is unavoidable. But some of that is also just an artifact of how this process works, of, this, of how these, uh, these need scores are being computed. And this is where we come in. Our approach is that we really want the selection probability of different people to be as equal as we can given the quotas. And this is what our algorithm does in a nutshell. So just to be clear, both the old software and the new software that you've developed, they all satisfy the quotas or potentially satisfy the quotas. It's all or the targets. Uh, but it's just sort of the, as an individual, if I were responding uh, to the mailing, it's, it's sort of uh, how, what the probability is for me as an individual to get into, uh, to get into the final target, what the chance is exactly. for me to get in there. And under the old system, uh, there were quite different sort of levels of chances. And under the new system, there are still quite different, you know, different probabilities for different kinds of people with different demographic makeups, mm -hmm. but it's better. Is that right? Yeah, so I mean, the idea is exactly what you just said, that we basically try to make the probabilities for each person as equal as possible, subject to the quotas. Um, and like you said, it's not always possible, and in fact, frequently, po frequently impossible um, to make them all equal to each other. And I just want to add one thing um, that this is nice for individuals. Um, certainly, if you've decided to volunteer, then you seem entitled to a chance to participate. But this is also nice because it means that you can't exacerbate um, like essentially excluding certain groups of people because the decisions about who to include at different steps are made based on people's features, right? And so if there's a certain group of people who an algorithm is very unlikely to select due to their quotas, for some reason, never being that dire in old algorithms, for example, um, there's no guarantee that the algorithm will try to include them anyway. It's very, it's possible that these people might be sort of systematically excluded. And so this is also has implications for groups in addition to individuals. And is what you mean there, Bailey, that sort of if you, like me, for example, belong to a bunch of sort of quite large majority groups in society, that, that you would be uh, sort of, uh, yeah, that, that you would have a much lower, a very low probability of being selected. This That's is sort of one place. So this is one place where we would see it. I think it depends actually a lot more on this unequal participation issue, where like if you're in a group of people who tends to participate really frequently, then you would be more at risk of um, being systematically excluded in existing algorithms. Um, but it's actually very hard to predict in general who will have low and high probabilities. And that's also something about the first iteration of algorithms um, that we were seeking to at least remedy to some extent um, with mathematical guarantees, basically. That's interesting. So, so it's interesting. So it's a little bit difficult to predict, you said. And 
it's down to who, who is it are most likely to participate, i.e., who responds to the mailing in the largest numbers. Is that, is that what you're getting at there? Or like largest fraction of their groups. But right, yeah. got it. Okay, fair enough. So let's talk a little bit about the software I itself and sort of the, um, the, the point behind it in a way or how it's going to be distributed. We uh, got it via the Sortition Foundation because we know them, but it's also completely open source and available online um, and is called the Stratification app, I believe, if you search for that and Sortition Foundation. Um, and Paul, can you talk a little bit about why, uh, why it's open source, why it's important that it's open source? and sort of what the future is for a distribution of this software so more folks can use it. Of course, um, it's very important that the software is open source and that you as an interested citizen, at least if you have the time and the knowledge, you can actually go through all this code and see that there's nothing up our sleeves, that everything is just there trying to make things as fairly and as equitably as possible. So this is what is possible given that it's open source. It also means that it's hopefully available to a wider range of different organizations, which means that the best algorithms can actually be used by statistician organizations all over the world. For us, it was very clear that this was the route that we wanted to go down because we're uh, academics. We, um, we're really trying to do this in the public interest and we're trying to promote statistician and uh, that is part of how we can do that. You were also mentioning future ways of distributing uh, the software and deploying the software. Uh, so right now, everybody can use the software, which is important. But granted, installation can be a hurdle. And so something that we are experimenting right now uh, on is putting all of this on a website where certain practitioners can directly use this without running it on their own local server, but they can use ours. And that would mean that potentially anybody could, could create a panel with a bunch of respondent data and, and categories with targets, and, and they could create a panel. Is that right? Absolutely. And not just a panel, but even they, they can even get the whole, a whole distribution of panels. They can uh, figure out what the best way to randomize over a whole lot of panels, maybe hundreds or thousands of panels, what the fairest way to do so is, and there's nothing up our sleeves. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, as, as folks who watch the selection event for this project may know, we ran the software on camera here in an event, and it produced a panel, and then we ran it to get some alternates. But there's another method, which I think we'll probably use in the future, which is that we will run it in advance 100 times or 1,000 times and come up with a, a whole bunch of, of, of panels, all of which fit the targets, but are composed of all different people. And then, as the sort of lottery, select from among those potential panels. Is that, that's kind of the method that you're talking about there, Paul, I think. Yeah, this is accurate, except that we don't actually run it 1,000 times independently, but we try to come up with a set of 1,000 panels that together, when you randomize over them, has the best properties. Ah, uh, interesting. OK, that's, a, that's an important distinction. Uh, Bailey, is there anything you'd like to add about the, the new software or sort of how it does what it does? Um, talking about like specifically how it does what it does uh, is essentially it does it through optimization um, which uses tools that we take off the shelf for the most part to solve difficult optimization problems um, there definitely is some other work that we do to make it run faster and be able to solve very large problems in practical time um, but i guess the thing that i would actually like to bring up is maybe just hone in a little bit more on this transparency angle um, and so the really nice thing uh, as you said, and as Paul said, about generating several panels ahead of time and then randomly picking from them um, via ideally some distribution that is as fair as possible to the individual volunteers, is that individual volunteers can observe all the possible panels and they can observe the chance with which they'll be chosen. And so they can confirm that they have some chance and they can confirm that others have other like other amounts of chance of being chosen. And so it allows people to observe the selection probabilities directly as opposed to watching a single panel be constructed and not necessarily observe through physical randomness um, how likely they are to be chosen. Yeah, that's a fabulous benefit. And I think there was even one project this summer where you could log in as a, as a uh, respondent and sort of see the panels among the thousand uh, that you that you are on and sort of watch in real time as the lottery was being done 
oh, which which panels am I still on? And uh, until we got until they got down to a, a, a one panel that was chosen, which was mm -hmm. kind of cool. Uh, kind of fun makes it look makes it feel more like a lottery uh, in real time, which is kind of cool. Well, uh, thank you both so much for your work on this and also for being here and helping to describe it. This has been a really fun conversation and we're excited about the future of sortition and we're excited about the work you're doing at Healthy Democracy too. Thank you for having us and yeah, I'm excited to see how the panel in Eugene goes. Awesome. Thanks so much. And thank you for watching. I'm Lynn Davis, Program Manager for Healthy Democracy. In the next episode, we'll be taking a deep dive into the process itself with our lead moderator for this project, Alex Ranieri. It'll be a fascinating and informative look into how we designed the panel and how a city in one virtual room is able to work together. I hope you'll join us. See you next time.